by NC State head coach Kevin Keats and uh, Rick Bozich. I'll let you have the first question. Hey, Kevin, congratulations from all the folks here in Louisville. Um, just wanted to ask two things. One, um, what has Rick Patino meant to your career? And secondly, what did you uh, gain from your time in Louisville and that Final Four run that's helped you this year? Uh, coach has been everything. I mean, he is um, obviously um, – <laughs> I think he's the GOAT and, you know, what he's done in his career and, you know, how many assistant coaches that he's had that went on to be successful um, head coaches, I think it means a lot. And, you know, the things, his preparation and how he prepares you for uh, life when you get your own program. So I can't say enough about him and, you know, his my time spent with him in those three years and those were you know, um, Final Four, going back to the Final Four that eventually won a national championship and Sweet 16s. Um, you know, I, I learned so much from him and um very grateful for the opportunity that he gave me in order for me to be a head coach um, going on to UNCW. Uh, great experience. I mean, you know, I was thinking last night how blessed I was, number one, to be going to my third Final Four. But um, it, it, it's even better knowing that you're leading the team to there as the head coach. Um, assistant coaches were great, you know, great cutting the nets, but, you know, getting the opportunity to lead your own program to the Final Four means a lot. Go ahead, Josh. Hey, Kevin. After winning in D.C., some of the guys in the locker room jokingly started chanting 30 for 30. Now that you guys are in the Final Four, some think this could be a movie one day. If that happened, who plays Kevin Keats in that movie? Well, I know who I would love to play, but he, but you know, by that time, by the time they make the movie, it's it'll be too late. As um, hey man, Denzel Washington is the coolest dude ever. Um, you know, so maybe I got to pick somebody a little younger. But if he could play, if anybody could pull it off, it would be him. It would be definitely Denzel Washington. He'd be the great. I you could always go back to a guy like Jamie Fox and um. You know, I have you seen the things on the uh, internet about him acting like a football coach? I think that was great. James Henderson, go ahead. Hey, Kevin, I know you uh, you mentioned last week having to navigate a transfer portal while doing all of this, and I know you can't mention specific players, but have you noticed the buzz that's been generated from some potential recruits based on what you guys are doing? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, uh, James, that's the hardest thing. Um, that I've had to do, you know, obviously winning games is really hard. So I let me make yeah. sure I clarify that because people say, oh, the hardest thing he's had to do. Um, but trying to, you know, balance scouting and, you know, uh, staying connected with my players and talking to them and trying to figure out, you know, the um, transfer report. I wish it wasn't going on at this time where we got, you know, uh, we're on a national stage. Um, but I, I have – seeing some excitement um, through some voices that I've talked to. Um, obviously, you know, I can't mention names, but I do think there is some um, folks taking notice of what we're doing. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Mark Berman, go ahead. Afternoon, Kevin. Congratulations. Hey, Mark. Um, wanted to ask you, I guess, uh, how how did your years at Ferrum College kind of uh, guide you down to the coaching path you're on now? Well, I, I think I learned to um, survive. Um, you know, when you're you're playing at a really small college, and you know, there's not a lot of national attention, and you're really playing the game for the love of the game and your commitment. And I think it, you know when you think about Ferrum and you think about Hargrave, those were two foundations that I would never pass up. Um, they really prepared me just to hard work and, um, you know, learning how to start at the grassroots levels, learning how to start at the bottom and, you know, work your way up. And the, you know, amount of hours you spend, you know, doing the the grunt work and not really getting paid for it. And it just humbles you and, and, and it, it teaches you that you got to continue to work and you put in the work that anything's completely possible. You know, I'm a small college kid. I was, um, you know, played at, you know, Farham in um, a small town and, you know, had an opportunity to go to Hargrave in another small town. And um, I will never forget that, you know, you know, the hard work that we had to put to put in to get where I'm at right now. And so, you know, working, uh, working for a year under Bill Pullen and obviously coaching under him, who's been at, you know, I, he was just at our uh, Sweet 16 and Elite Eight game means a lot. And um, he was instrumental in, um 
you know, uh, directing my career. David Teal, go ahead. Kevin, are are there specific things from Louisville's 13 run? I think you guys won your last 16 games that that, that season. As you watch Rick navigate, especially you know, the three games at the Garden and then the six-game run through the NCAA tournament, there are things you learned about managing a team through a stretch like that that you have applied to this group? Yeah, we we had a incredible David. We had an incredible stretch there, and I, I remember um, Coach Patino talking about we were going to go into the Big East and win the Big East, and we certainly did. The weird thing about it is this one is different than anything I've ever been around. Um, you know, we have you know nine elimination games. Once you think about that, you know we got you know. Back then, obviously, winning the Big East, you had to win three, which which was, was really good. We had a tough stretch that we had to go through. But well, winning five games starting on Tuesday as a number 10 seed and to go through the really good teams at the back end of it, if you lose any of those games, you don't go to the NCAA, including the championship probably. And then now, you know, after that, you go on and you got four games, which we all know in the NCAA tournament, you lose a game, you go home. I don't know that I've ever seen a run um, that's similar to this. And and I have to give all the credit to our, you know, our players and how they stayed focused. And uh, I don't know, you know, it's hard to do when you know your back's against the wall and anytime you lose, then, you know, you're, you're done with, especially in that ACC tournament. And so I think where there could be some similarities, um, I don't know that there are a lot of them because they're completely different. Um, you know, our, our team back in 2013 was completely different in how they were motivated compared to the guys that we have today. Noah Flashman, go ahead. Going off of that, you know, what's been the biggest thing you've learned just through the NCAA tournament portion of this run about your team and just, just these last two weeks that you've been on? Well, what I've learned is we are completely locked in and focused. Um, you know, the, the moment has not bothered us. And I know a lot of people was, was thinking, hey, you know, when they get to this stage, uh, there were a lot of folks that thought, you know, winning the ACC would be enough, um, you know, and people would be satisfied, but not in our locker room. Um, our locker room, you know, our guys, you know, when we got, you know, when we got into the tournament before the even selection Sunday, all we thought about is, you know, let's take one game at a time, but we wanted to come in and have a chance to compete for a national championship. And rarely do you see that. I mean, you know, the way things, um, you know, us winning the tournament, our guys could have been, you know, relaxed a little bit. Um, you know, you play a great Texas Tech team and then you get a team in Oakland who's hot, who just beat Kentucky and to stay focused to finish that game. And then you go on and play a good Marquette team who's really good, who can beat anybody on any given night. And then, by the way, you you face your opponent um, in Duke, who's really good, who was a rivalry game, and they were able to respond. So I think the, the biggest takeaways of that is our guys are locked in. Um, they've responded to every different situation that we had. And um, not only have we, we responded, we've kind of got stronger each game. Ben Cates, go ahead. Coach Ben Cates, the Lynchburg News in Advance. Um, I I know that your hometown means a lot to you. Is there, can you think of some experiences about growing up here that kind of shaped your life and, and shaped your coaching career? Oh, you know, I love Lynchburg. Um, it's um, home for me. My parents still live there, my aunts, my cousins. Um, I just, look, I grew up on outdoor basketball courts and I grew up when there were chain nets and I grew up when on, on a Saturday or Sunday, you know, you would play, you know, the, the courts would be so packed that if you lost the game, you'd have to get in the car and try to go to another court to be able to get on there and play. And so I really got my toughness and foundation, um, you know, from Lynchburg. And um, it's, it's, you know, that place means a lot to me. And, you know, I try to get back as much as I can. It's a little bit tougher, even though it's closer to me. But, you know, playing, uh, being a two-sport um, guy in, in Lynchburg and um, playing football and basketball and juggling that and um, just the the great folks that live there, it means a lot to me. But I want to say, you know, I if you look at one thing, I think the toughness came from Lynchburg, Virginia, and that's where, you know, that's where it all started for me. 
Dan Wolken, go ahead. Yeah, Kevin, I was I was curious why you went back to Hargrave after you were at Marshall. And at that point in your career, did you have aspirations of, you know, coaching at the, you know, big time colleges or were you content, you know, at that at that level doing doing, you know, dealing with that side of the of the business? Yeah, great question. Um, I, you know, so I, I took when I got the Hargrave job, I was there for two years and worked for a guy named Scott Shepard, who went on to be Pete Gillen's assistant at UVA. And I actually went into the uh, headmaster at the time, the colonel, and and told him I wanted the job when Scott left. He didn't believe that. He's like, really? And so I said, yeah. And so he gave me the job. And I was there for two years. And I looked at the path that Scott had taken. And I said, you know what? If an opportunity came across, I would I would take it. And of course, I got a chance to uh, work for a great guy in Greg White, who has also been a mentor to me in my life, and went to Marshall. And when I got to Marshall, you know, towards the end of the second year, Greg and I talked. And I know it was an opportunity that he probably was going to leave. And it was weird because it came up at the same time. He talked about leaving. And I, you know, I was thinking, hey, you know what? I kind of miss working with the guys at the grassroots level. And so I decided, um, talking to Greg, and he he blessed it because I think he was going to leave anyway. I decided to come back to Hargrave. I got a great opportunity to come back. And I was there for eight years, and uh, I was content with not taking another job. My parents were 45 minutes up the road. Um, you know, for you guys who, you know, Fletcher Eric was um, – at Fork Union. And I was like, man, Fletcher Erd has been to Fork Union for 40 some years and I'm going to be the next Fletcher Erd. And, and then, you know, fortunately I got a call eight years after that and it changed everything. And that was to go to Louisville to be assistant coach and kind of the rest becomes history. But I had no intent on getting back into college until I got a call from uh, Rick Patino and, you know, believe it or not, he sold me on the opportunity. Rachel Brandon, go ahead. Hi, Coach. Thanks for doing this um, with ABC 13 and Lynchburg as well. Wanted to ask you, what's your message to kids watching you right now in the tournament coming from Lynchburg, showing that somebody from this small area can do this? Yeah, I would say trade, I mean, to stay true to your dreams. You know, I was that young kid running around in Lynchburg that didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, had no clue what path I was going to take. Um, but I had, you know, parents who loved me and I would say, listen to your parents, um, listen to the folks that's around you that are really positive influence, try to keep a great reputation, um, and stay, stay to your academics. Uh, if you can get involved with some type of activity, uh, after school, whether it's sports or anything else, stay locked and in, locked into that and, and try to make the best of um, everything you can. And, you know, dreams do come true and mine came true. And I think any young person uh, in Lynchburg can achieve and do even better than I'm doing right now. So that would be my message. CL Brown, go ahead. Hey, Kevin, kind of going back to, uh, to coach Patino, what, why do you say, what is the formula that, so many of his former assistants or players have been able to be successful as head coaches? Well, first of all, CL, you've been around, man. He challenged you every day. Um, you know, there wasn't a day that I wasn't challenged. And I was challenged, and not only me, everybody in the office, to be not good, to be great. You know, I think one of the, the main things that stood out to me was, um, you know, when he hired me, he said, I don't hire assistant coaches. I hire future head coaches. Um, and so I think the preparation, you know, CL, we were in the office from 6 a.m. all the way to nighttime at all time, but we were prepared. And, you know, uh, what I learned is how to be organized, how to be prepared, um, how to run a program. And I will say this about um, Coach Patino. He doesn't put you in a box. Um, you know, he doesn't bring you there just as a recruiter. He doesn't be, bring you there as just a scout guy. You've got, you have to do everything. And I think that's one of the biggest things that some coaches at his level who are Hall of Famers don't allow their staff to grow, and um, he allows you to grow. Dash Ty Hurt, go ahead. Hi, Coach. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about DJ Burns. He's obviously become a fan favorite. I believe you recruited him when he was transferring from Tennessee. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what about him? Now, can you tell me a bit about that recruiting process? And is there any funny story that you can give us that was maybe a, a foreshadowing of what we're seeing now on the national stage? Well, when DJ Burns went to Tennessee, and I may, I think I'm right when I say this, I think he was a really young kid and may even graduated a little earlier. So he was a little immature. Uh, I can't remember if I recruited him before he went to Tennessee or when he was leaving Tennessee, I think it was before. Um, I think what we're getting is the more mature version of DJ Burns than when he was five or six years ago. But the one thing that has stayed consistent about him is he's a tremendous personality. I think he's always been that. Um, his mom and dad have done a great job of building a great foundation and surrounding him with great folks. Um, but I don't have a funny story, but the, the guy's a great personality. He really is. And, you know, um, it, it's, it's really helped our team. Uh, I think people in Raleigh, people in South Carolina, where he's from, they know DJ Burns. But it's so great to see people on a national level be able to interact with him and really see his true personality. Just a quick follow up. Have you seen the walkout videos that have gone viral? And, and what are your thoughts on that? I just I mean. <laughs> I don't have thoughts on it. I mean, they just, it's, he is what he is, man. He is, uh, you know, he walks out there and um, he looks good doing it. So I don't, I don't think he should ever stop it, but you know, now, now we've got the boom boxes and everything else going on. So it's pretty, it's a pretty good thing. Thank you. Rod Baxley, go ahead. Kevin, what stood out to you the most, man, since you guys got back from uh, Dallas and, and have been in Raleigh these last few days? Well, I, I think what stood out is the – what makes me really happy is that we have students on our campus that have never experienced this. And, you know, I, I was walking around campus um, yesterday, and um, they were so excited about what our team's doing so excited about what our ladies are doing. And they just never experienced that. Most of our students can only experience that through what their parents may have told them or maybe even their grandparents. And I think that's the biggest thing. That makes me happy. I mean, this is a, this is a proud university with uh, great alumni. But when you see our current students and our players feeling and excited about what's going on, I think that's a great thing. Thanks, Kevin. Go ahead, Corey Smith. Hey Kevin, I wanted to ask you. Oh, I wanted to ask you really quickly about the impact of a guy like Casey Morsell. Obviously, you know what he's done with this program. I remember back to that Clemson game, him lifting you up and, and carrying you after that Clemson win, and then you know to say that he wanted to get a banner for this program and everything along those lines. Now seeing all that come to fruition, but what has he meant to you from a relationship standpoint, and what has he meant to this team being the most experienced player on this roster? Well, first of all, I love Casey Morsell. I mean, he is, um, he's a first class person. And, you know, I'm so grateful that, you know, he came to um, NC State to play for me. I think I've started him more than anybody I've started in my career. So you know how I feel about him as a basketball player. Um, he's what, you know, a student athlete should be about, you know, just a great person, great ambassador, both on and off the court. Um, he does a good job within our program. And he's kind of, you know, every team has a glue guy. And we can make an argument that Casey's one of our glue guys. Um, maybe not getting the national attention that, you know, maybe a DJ Burns or a DJ Horn's getting. But the things that he's quietly doing on the court has been so important uh, to our program. You know, I kid him a lot. I talked to him about, you know, John Kel Joyner coming in and being a better defender than him and also Jaden Taylor. But I'm telling you the last – you know, six, seven, eight games. He's been one of our best defenders. Uh, he has done whatever his team needed to help us win. J.C. Zimble, go ahead. Uh, kind of building off of what you said with Casey, with the three seniors, you know, this is their COVID year, basically. You know, how much of a huge advantage has it been to see players who have been in college for five years and in D.J. Burns' case, six years? 
It's been great, you know, just the, the experience that these guys have had and they brought to the table. And, you know, for example, you know, all of those guys have found their voice, you know, and that that's a great thing. And I think it's great for our locker room to have some older guys that kind of been through different programs, but have come together to make this program successful. And so it's been a, it's been a blessing. You know, we've only got really one freshman on our team, basically, and Dennis Parker Jr., and to have those three seniors and then you add guys like Michael O'Connor to the uh, mix of it um, and, and even Ben, those guys have been great. And everybody now is talking. Everybody now has found a voice to help our team and help our, everyone along. James Anderson, go ahead. Kevin, I did want to ask you about Michael as well. Uh, just what does he add as a connective piece for you guys? I mean, he seems like every game, whether it's assists, rebounds, points some nights, he's giving you something different. Yeah, you know what? He is – he's one of those guys, James, that probably people doubted and didn't give credit because he's not one of those guys that scored the basketball. And so in college basketball, everything is about how much you score. Um, but when you really look at what he's done for our team – He's allowed other guys to be great. Um, he's allowed, you know, he's a willing passer. Um, he's also been a really good defender for us. Um, but he's the guy that kind of runs the show and gets everybody involved. And uh, and the one thing that he's done better now is that, you know, I, when I walk in and, at halftime early in the year, you wouldn't hear anything from Michael. Now he's talking. Now he's got a voice. Um, he is coaching as a player which is always good when your point guard's on the floor. So he's become an extension of our coaching staff opposed to just a point guard that's out there. Go ahead, Noah. Coach, I know you're a coach that likes, you know, NIL and the positive things that can come out of it. You know, what has it been like for you the past couple of weeks to see, you know, the two DJs especially kind of take advantage and, and be able to, you know, get some NIL deals through the success in the tournament? I think it's great. I think this is exactly what NIL is about. I think it's a wonderful thing, um, you know, and and these guys are fully taking advantage of it. But I will say this, they haven't let it get, get in the middle of them being really good teammates and, you know, giving everything to their team. But I think when you think about what's going on now, this is the time that, you know, kids get an opportunity to showcase itself and obviously take advantage of their name, image, and likeness. Go ahead, David. Kevin, I think with the possible exception of Marquette, you have outscored every team you've played during this run after halftime. Is it just great adjustments from the head coach or what's going on there in the locker room? I just think we're in great shape. And, you know, we've always prided ourselves of being in great shape. And it's it's even more impressive because we our rotation has been like seven and maybe eight guys. Um, but – you know, at halftime, it, it seems like that, you know, these guys are coming in, you know, coming back locked in, and um, our, our conditioning is really playing, paying off. Go ahead, Mark Berman. Uh, yeah, Kevin, I wanted to ask you, looking back at your game back when you were a player, what was it about your game that you wound up at, a, at Ferrum at a Division, Division three school instead of a higher level? Well, I was playing for the love of the game, uh, Mark. I didn't didn't know if I was going to be a football player or a basketball player, but I decided to go basketball because I got tired of taking free hits. Um, and, and Bill did a great job recruiting me. Mark, I want you to go back and look this up because you can. My best game at Firm was when Bill, Bill Pullen got kicked out of the game. I told him the other day uh, he got kicked out of the game, and I think I had 30 against Merrillville. And I told him, I was like, you're the only guy that really ever held me on the 20 points was my coach. So we joked about that a little bit. But um, I have a tremendous respect for anyone who plays really small college basketball because really you're doing it for the love of the game. And that's what I did. So how good a high school quarterback were you? I thought I was good. I mean, the only problem is I had – you know, two guys in my backfield that rushed for a thousand yards, so I didn't get a chance to pass it a lot. I was a I was an option quarterback, and my option was either hand it off or I was going to go sit on the bench. All right, last question, Rick. Go ahead. Yeah, Kevin, I just wanted to ask you. I I, I watched when Louisville played you in the ACC tournament. What was going through your mind 
at halftime when they were up by one and then the game was really tied with five minutes to go. How how was your team able to uh, not flinch at that point? Well, we just want to stay the course. Um, if, if you if you're a coach, uh, most coaches will tell you that the toughest game of any tournament is typically the first one. Everybody's nervous. You know, everybody's trying to figure it out. And so we wanted to stay the course. I thought Louisville came out and played extremely hard. Scott Clark had a tremendous game against us, but I thought we would just stay the course and focus. Um, I was a little bit nervous uh, because we didn't have DJ Horn and who would step up um, in his absence. And we had some guys that played well. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Coach Keats. Thanks, guys. Go Thanks, Kevin.